episode of Genres of People. Uh, this is a weekly series where we chat with notable uh, community members who have converged and contributed to the wonderful community of Guelph. Um, I'm Nick Weaver of Game Media, and today I'm talking to Omri and Abby of uh, Otherwise Studios. So thanks for joining us here. Thanks so for much having us, us Nick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. So. Um, we were kind of mentioning it, it's funny all the different kind of connections I think that we all have, but uh, we haven't really crossed paths before. So uh, it's great to be able to kind of have this chat and, and get to know you and what you do at the studio and everything. Um, so first off, I'm, I'm curious, are both of you from Guelph? Neither of us are from Guelph. I'm originally from London, Ontario, so not too far away. Um, born and raised in yeah. London, and then I came to Guelph for school. Yeah, and um, I grew up in Ottawa, and then my family now lives in Perth, Ontario. Um, so super small town, uh, but like Omri, came to Guelph originally for university. That's great. Yeah, it seems to and then uh, stuck around. Yeah, it seems to attract <laughs> a lot of a lot of uh, different different types of people, and it's got this great community. I feel. Um, so what what was it? Uh, you both kind of came for for school. So what was it in particular that that kind of drew you to Guelph over other other schools? It's yeah. It's funny because we kind of have the same story. I don't know, Abby. You can you can tell it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we both um, thought we had no. Not that it wasn't a special moment, but we both had the same special moment in why we chose to come to Guelph. Um, both of us had uh, other schools and other places that we had in mind, um, but ultimately we fell in love with the University of Guelph for its studio art program and specifically for its like tight knit community. Like when I personally went for a tour, um, the tour didn't really include anything about the studio arts program. So um, I was with my mom at the time and we wandered into the Zavitz building, which is like at the center of uh, the campus. And uh, I just fell in love with the building and then um, actually, Martin Pierce, who's um, a prof at the university, um, he actually approached me. I apparently looked like I was very lost. lost. <laughs> <laughs> and and he actually like gave me a full tour of uh, classes that were like um, there. We went to like a drawing class. We went to a painting class. Uh, he even took me to some of the. Um, there's something called specialized studios where it's typically in your last year, um, you get your own little studio space and you can kind of work on your own practice. So he took me into there. And I, I think at that point I was like, there is no other school that cool. can, yeah, that can compare with not only like the facilities, but also the fact that this person like walked me through at their own time, uh, everyone, that was in the classes was so open and like excited that there was someone who was interested. It was just like, you could feel that everyone wanted to be there and was excited. That's really great. Yeah, I, I find I find that with uh, with Guelph, it's got this unique kind of uh, just feel to it. I don't I don't know how to mm -hmm. explain it other than that. It's just kind of got that 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 pull, I guess. Definitely. Um, so I, I, uh, I also try and do, uh, and it's funny with us uh, just to mention the connections and everything, because uh, people do come from such a, a wide background and come to school here and um, it, it just get drawn in through different things, whether it's just the architecture or the people or whatever else, but it seems to be a, a combination of those things. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, I was doing like a little bit of research and I try and get to know, uh, you know, the guests through, I guess, through LinkedIn more is where I do a lot of my research. Um, but I, I was realizing that that's not always a great place to do research because it's not always up to date. Um, <laughs> like mine is not up to date at all. So uh, I kind of made some mess ups in an interview asking questions. He's like, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> so, um, but in, uh, Amri, in my research, I, I saw that you do you did a lot of volunteer work while you were um, at school and attending. Um, how how did you find time for that? And, and uh, you know, including with your studies, too? Yeah, um, I think I've always been someone who's been super involved in like every aspect that I possibly can get involved in. Um, and I think the answer is maybe at times I, I didn't find the time, like sometimes I didn't balance it very well, which is uh, something, I don't know, I think it's important to, <laughs> to learn about yourself, what your limits are for burnout. Um, but I think 
I don't know, the University of Guelph had so many um, opportunities to get involved that it was kind of hard to say no. And then once you get involved, you kind of, it's like a snowball effect of how many things <laughs> you start doing. Um, but yeah, I think, I don't know, in terms of balancing the time, I think I probably didn't. <laughs> um, if I'm being completely honest, I don't know if I have a better option answer than that. I think like by the time I got to fourth year, I was a lot better at managing my time and figuring out, you know, prioritizing different things. And at that point I was involved in everything I was involved in was, were things that I was super passionate about. So it's kind of easier to find time for things that you're um, really invested in. Um, I think like at that point, my, my schooling was really curated towards my specific practice and my volunteer things were um, things that I were interested, was interested in doing after school. So I think it was kind of a mix of maybe not always finding the time to balance it, but also <laughs> making the time because um, they were things that were like really pushing me to, I don't know, do, do more. And, and I got really invested in the community. So I think it was just a matter of passion. I think that made me balance the time. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And, and it's, it's tough because I think uh, a lot of people come into school and, and don't throw themselves into it. You know, it's very easy to kind of get sidetracked with jobs or other things that you're doing or whatever else. So mm -hmm. um, it is important, I think, to kind of be that engaged because my, myself, I, I found it really hard to, to do that just because of all the other things I was doing while trying to attend school too so it's so true yeah for sure yeah and I think for me it was just a matter of getting involved with like one maybe two, one or two clubs at the beginning and then those things led to other things and I have a hard time I have a really hard time saying no <laughs> so it just <laughs> it, very they kept building people. yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, I wouldn't I wouldn't take back any of it though it was all like so valuable even mm -hmm. even if there were times of burnout I think there were also times of like extreme um community building and like validation in those things so mm -hmm. i'm i'm grateful for all of those experiences for sure yeah that's that's great that sounds amazing and it's, it's one of those things where you, you start a job you got to get it done yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said yes now you gotta do it <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah so uh, Abby, I, I noticed as well that you you also took on uh, quite a lot of responsibilities uh throughout uh, when you were in university um, but it seemed to be kind of largely more in organizational things and, and like uh, instructional sort of things. So what was it that, that drew you more to, I guess, that, that side of things? And, and what kind of projects would you take on when you were, uh, you know, in the fine arts department and things like that? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I think a lot of it stems from me wanting things to happen for everyone that you really like. And typically one of, I don't know if this is true, but like for, in my perspective is like, if you want something to happen, you've got to run it or you've got to gather everyone. You've got to make the plan. You've like the, and, and that's super fun. Like it's super fun to get people excited. And, and uh, so a lot of my volunteer roles were kind of more like leadership roles and uh, just kind of motivating people to want things to happen at the school, um, like different events and uh, shows and like just interesting collaborative projects. So I think something that I learned like during school was if there's something that you like are dreaming of, like there's no point in waiting for it to happen and for someone else to initiate that, but kind of just to get the, ball rolling yourself yeah that's and that's, that's a great great mentality for sure because uh it, it can be tough you know because you don't always know what you want to do when you're first getting into school and mm -hmm. there's so many different paths and and you know distractions too right so mm -hmm. um yeah that's 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 great um, yeah I was a little I was a little bit older I started university when I was 23 so I was a little bit older I didn't have like the party like first year mm -hmm mentality so I think I was already pretty like excited to be in university and to make the most of it um so that probably weighed into things as well yeah for sure and, and that, that experience is always interesting because if you're if you're kind of just right out of high school and you just go right into university it's very easy mm -hmm. to kind of have that happen where you're not exactly sure what you want to do and it can get distracting I guess <laughs> yeah <laughs> for sure <laughs> so it was also um, I Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna say, like, Abby was also in those roles. I think 
like you you talk about making things happen if you want them to happen but you were also making opportunities and I think that that was a big like Abby was mm-hmm everyone's cheerleader <laughs> for yeah. the people who maybe everyone, didn't know what they cheerleader. wanted yeah <laughs> she was everyone's cheerleader that's amazing you gotta have that yeah. <laughs> so you guys uh you guys have both obviously known each other for a long time um you and you you kind of talked about uh, a collaborative art project that you'd both kind of connected with um and you didn't know each other prior to that so how how did that start was that through a class or how tell us how that uh started yeah uh, it actually wasn't through a class at all. Um, and I don't know how this initial seed even was planted ever. Um, it was very organic, but I remember, so our, our university has um, a campus gallery called Zavitz Gallery. And um, at the beginning of every new semester, there is an, a call for submissions to have a show. Um, and, and for some reason, I don't know if Omri <laughs> knows, know. but for some reason, Omri and I connected with one another, like face to face. And we're like, do you want to oh, no. have a show with me? Yeah, I think it was. So we weren't like complete strangers, but we hadn't really ever talked because we were both in um, a student club called the Fine Arts Network, which was a group of studio art and art history and people who are interested in arts. Um, we were both in that club since first year, but we didn't talk to each other until third year and we had a painting class at that point I think yeah I think we yeah. were in a painting class and so we we knew each other we knew about each other sort of but like never really talked so only had that one painting class together and like saw each other once a year or once a week at the student club so I yeah I really don't know how yeah, <laughs> we decided we, to think, collaborate think- but we did yeah, I think we both we both wanted to have an unconventional show in the sense mm-hmm. that we just wanted to transform the space. We didn't want to like show off our work that we had already been working with because our practices from like a very like just looking at it don't really look like they connect. We just both knew that we wanted to just like alter the space completely. Um, so we had a show called Double Take um, and from your first appearance, you just see a, a kind of dimly lit room. Uh, we painted the entire floor blue um, and you enter the room and you almost don't see anything until you kind of kind of renegotiate your surroundings. And um, after further investigation, you kind of start noticing things that have been placed. So we actually had um, basically two sculptures that were pretty invisible like you we we documented it but you don't see anything in the yes. photos there's no documentation there, of it, really <laughs> but they were these like large webs of we took like um nylon string clear nylon string and had them protrude from the corners into the gallery space so once you come in you don't see it until you're like right in front of it um, which was really cool because we actually found out a lot of people um, experience it very differently. Some people looked in and it didn't look like there was anything in it. So they kind of, that was their experience. Other people spent hours kind of like going through, seeing if they could get into things. And so there, there's a wide, wide range of how people like interacted with that. Um, and then that was kind of like the first time that we realized that we were like really, really drawn to working with one another, that like Mm -hmm. our brains meshed well, how we worked together uh, was like really ideal. It was, and it it just kind of like happened off of a whim. Yeah, I think it was at that moment, it's it's always fun telling a story because it's like, it's very nostalgic to think about it because I think that was, from being complete strangers to doing that project together, we somehow in the span of whatever that was, like three days that we installed that project, (laughs) became best friends. (laughs) And I think it's just, um, yeah, it was a moment that I think excited us because it was different than anything either of us had done before. Um, And we knew that, yeah, we worked well together and, and wanted to continue doing it. So that was sort of the start of collaborative art practice together which yeah then... I remember I remember the I don't know if you remember this moment Omri but I remember it the night before uh sitting like on the, the floor night, sitting on the floor yeah in the corner, <laughs> and we I think we were like really scared 
I'm like getting we were scared terrified. now thinking about it. Like getting scared <laughs> that like what are we doing? Like this, what is this that we this just is ridiculous? Made? Like are like is this dumb? Is this too much? Is this like but also this is kind of cool and just kind of like having that like fuzzy tummy feeling that we were onto something really interesting and that, I, I don't yeah. know I, I feel like that I remember, memory is like ingrained yeah I remember sitting on the floor and being terrified but then we were also talking about <laughs> how being terrified is exciting like I think being mm-hmm. terrified means that you care about it right it means that you're mm-hmm. doing yeah. something so yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's great. I mean, that's, it's, uh, it's kind of, I guess, like facing that uh, ultimate, you know, fear of what if, right? And, and mm-hmm. I, it's amazing hearing that because I think, um, you know, life is art. And, and it's, it's amazing when, when, that, when people kind of find those connections, I guess, beyond mm-hmm. their, you know, for no reason, you know, you just got together and just started creating things. And, yes. and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's, uh, it's great to be in tune with that, too, I find, because some people necessarily, don't necessarily pay attention to that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, you guys, you were also both working at uh, the art gallery then. Um, was that also while you were attending university or, or was how, how did you get involved with uh, the gallery there? Yeah, I started with a work study at the, at the gallery. So um, the University of Guelph has a program where uh, you can like work 10 hours a week um, while doing your schooling and essentially just get paid while working. And so I got a job at the Art Gallery of Guelph and was working with their um, their gallery coordinator doing like installs and preparatory work and stuff and then it sort of turned into more of a job than work study and then I later like when I graduated I started doing uh programming with them um so that was sort of it kind of started as work study and then grew into more of a job and um Abby came on for install yeah Um, I I've only held that position uh like I'm only there for installs and deinstalls um and yeah, I like, I like handling art. I like helping, like, I just like the behind the scenes, obviously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would so working a good on one. the install team was yeah. like super fun. Yeah, I was wondering what it was like to kind of work in an art gallery, just because it seems like it'd be so fascinating. You know, you're always kind of experiencing different art and putting different pieces up and meeting new people and all that. And that's, that's great. Yeah, yeah it's super my hands favorite, on. Yeah, I think one of my favorite parts is like getting, I, I don't know if a lot of people are like this, but like as a kid, you know, being told don't touch the art is like <laughs> such a tempting thing. You're like, I want to touch all of the art now. <laughs> and so like when you when you get to work in a in a gallery space, you get to handle all the art. And obviously we're like very mindful and taking all the precautions needed, but also you get to like touch the art. So yeah. that's, that's pretty cool. And you get yeah. to meet a lot of the artists too. And so it's, it's a, it's a great inv- environment for sure. Yeah. It's pretty inspiring to like be surrounded by artists and be holding the art and moving mm-hmm. art around and then go home and be like, what art can I make today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah that's great. So yeah. uh, to touch on, I guess, not exactly the, the art theme, but Omri, I noticed that you uh, just volunteer work at, at John F. Ross. Um, yeah. it, it, it's kind of a funny Guelph connection uh, because it, amidst all the interviews that I've done, I just keep on meeting people who were you know, involved with Ross and I went there, you know, a long time ago now, nice. um, but uh, was that, was that for your, your French minor for volunteering or what was, how did that happen? It was, yeah, they, so same as work study, like work study is a part of a broader experiential learning program at the University of Guelph um, and experiential learning is essentially like any hands-on um, hands-on learning essentially um and it it goes for like a huge range of things but one of the experiential learning courses that I did was a French um essentially French teaching so the whole point of the course was to um we kind of there was like a segment of the course where you sat and you learned like different ways of teaching and you know oral presentations and this and that and whatever else and then you go into the workforce essentially and and teach and so uh we were responsible for setting up our own kind of placements um with some like either an elementary school or a high school in Guelph um and actually funnily enough funnily I don't know if that's a word but (laughs) (laughs) funny enough um one of my colleagues at the art gallery of Guelph had told me about an art uh teacher Karen Silverstone uh who was teaching at John F. Ross at the time and just teaching art um and so instead of going into 
a French classroom and teaching French vocabulary and grammar, I was able to teach French art, which was pretty cool. It's it it was a really good program at John F. Ross too. I was very impressed. Um, yeah, that, that yeah so it was part of my French minor. Yeah, that's, cool. that's awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. learning, learning anytime I learn people speak French, I, I love it because I took immersion growing up. So it's something that I feel is is important for you know for Canadian culture to to really encourage that another language basically <laughs> for sure yeah I'm so thankful I have a second language I feel like mm-hmm. it's helped me a lot in a lot of different aspects but it's also just cool to be able to like have the option of of speaking French to someone um like teaching teaching French art or you know translating materials or I don't know talking to a kid that you babysit in French or <laughs> whatever else that might be it's it's been a good skill for sure yeah, and I, I think sometimes people, I, I remember growing up, there was always the, the English muffins and the, the French, you know, French fries. There was a you know, back and forth kind of whatever. <laughs> I've never right? heard that before. I love yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's a small town thing, but it was, um, <laughs> it, was it was something that, that kind of, um, it was like you were, you, it was, you were weird for learning French, you know, like, and, and for us mm-hmm. in immersion, you were in one class and you had the same class every year because it was such a small group of people. But um, it, it's, it's always nice kind of finding uh, interesting ways to connect with kids with a language, I think, and that's important to kind of do it through art or through um, other. For sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and art was interesting because it was. Um, I feel like, to a certain extent, French for people who don't speak French all the time, like who aren't French first language, um, it can be a barrier for kind of expressing yourself if you're not completely confident or completely fluent in French. And I myself have had that issue before where I'm like I can't find the French words yeah. <laughs> um but so it can be it can be a challenge but it can also be really amazing especially when I was teaching the French or like assisting to teach the French um class I was learning a lot through uh Karen Silverstone who's an amazing artist um and an amazing teacher and she kind of taught me different ways of um communicating using French but also really like leaning on the visual art side of things to help students communicate um so like art almost in that way acted as a creative expression but also as a way to learn the language which I found really interesting yeah that's really cool that's really cool mm-hmm. so to, to touch on I guess the art instructor side of things uh, Abby you've been doing a lot of that I see from over the years um <laughs> I noticed that you were doing that in in, uh, in Perth uh, I'm I'm a little familiar with the town just because I've booked at least one or two bands from from there. But um, oh. how how did you get involved in in that at, in the first place for the instruction side? Yeah, so uh, my first job uh, was working at a little store called Art in Class, and in this little cute stop store, um, we kind of taught classes to all age ranges and sold a little bit of like art uh, at the front of the store. I actually got the job uh, through my high school like co-op program. So, um, and I was their first co-op student because I was like eager um, (laughs) as always to like have an art job. So I, um, uh, with the help of like my counselor at the time, uh, I was like, can I approach these, this business and see if they would be interested in having a co-op student. And so I did. And uh, luckily enough, they were willing to take me on under their ring. And that's kind of the first time uh, that I like taught. I started just teaching kids crafts and typically it would just be like um, there they had kind of like a drop off system. So mom and dad or parents and guardians would uh, come and drop their kid off for two hours whenever you didn't necessarily know when and uh you just kind of have to have a a craft like off off the top of your head and uh make sure that they had fun so that was like the first time that I ever taught um that being said like both my mom and dad are amazing teachers like my dad um teaches carpentry so well and then my mom also has she's a nurse and has taught at uh um a couple colleges. So like, I feel like I've always had kind of like a, a love for teaching and learning um, throughout my childhood. And after high school, um, and I took a little bit of time uh, just to work and live a little bit before I went to university, but I like teaching has always been like in my core and I really value 
um, making learning accessible um, because sometimes it can be scary to learn new things and uh, also like failing is kind of like really intimidating. But if we kind of as teachers can bridge that gap between uh, learning a new skill, which is super exciting and um, the chances of failing and kind of make it kind of on the same playing field that it's all good, it's, it's all um, a part of the process. I think that's when people um, can really like obtain the information and, and learn those, those new skills. Yeah, for sure. Cause especially, you know, younger kids, there's, it's, it's, it's tough because some are mm -hmm. super shy and then some are really outgoing and want to do everything. So it's, it's definitely a tough balance. Um, I remember being a, a camp counselor for quite a while and, and <laughs> having to kind of do that, that balancing of all those different personalities. So that's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Every, everyone's so different, right? So like mm -hmm. I, like some people are really hard on themselves. So the learning curve there is just kind of teaching acceptance. And then some people maybe aren't driven enough. So just kind of giving that like that positive push that that is needed. Yeah. And you never know where they're coming from. So being as open mm -hmm. as that for sure. So you're, yeah. you're still, uh, you've done the, uh, the art instructing at a couple of different uh, places as well. So you work with the city of Guelph for a little while. What was, uh, what was, was that similar to what you're doing before or? Yeah, um, the uh, city of Guelph, I taught a couple different classes. I taught um, and uh, mainly to kids or teens. That was kind of like the age range that I was working for the city for. Um, we did a couple photography classes, some drawing classes, some uh, digital media classes um, all over the city. Um, it was really fun because uh, typically when kids are enrolled in like city programming, they're really, really um, interested in the program that they're being put into. So um, a lot of the kids are like super motivated and driven and excited and open to learning. Um, and so that's always exciting. Um, and, it, and it was great working for the city. I feel like uh, since the programming was all over the city, I got to kind of meet a lot of the community and uh, feel like a little bit more at home with Guelph because I think I was in my second year when I started working for the city as an instructor. So it was a nice way to kind of uh, kind of set some roots. For sure. Yeah, I, I find I find with the city, it's, it's very, uh, it's great. and It's very accepting. and There's a lot of programs. Um, mm -hmm. But I think some, sometimes almost what happens is that there gets to be kind of some organizations or people that end up kind of almost uh, getting into little silos. And it's something that we kind of have talked about with wealth tourism and whatever else of trying to kind of bridge those gaps and trying to open it up of, um, because some people sometimes will only work with certain people and whatever else. Right. So having those programs is, is great. And I know the city has had a lot of uh, initiatives to kind of push that to open it up because it's, it's hard to find programs sometimes too and get people involved and all that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, definitely. So I, I of course wanted to touch on uh, the studio um and what uh, what you're doing currently uh so how how did otherwise uh get going and and what was kind of some of the motivations behind that <laughs> um i i laugh because it wasn't um it, it wasn't like premeditated really it was um it was sort of going with gut feelings i think um we like so, everything we do almost yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> everything <laughs> um yeah Abby did a mentorship program um like we both did the mentorship program but Abby was paired with a collaborative duo um artist duo called Kayam so Kyle and Amanda um who at the time were living in Guelph and were Guelph local artists and now they're living in Collingwood um and they sort of became our collective mentors after mm -hmm. Abby sort of maintained um Abby maintained a relationship with them after the the program and the program was through Welfare Arts Council um and then after we started working together they sort of became our collective members um or mentors sorry mm -hmm. and they reached out to us one night like over Instagram they were like hi um can you meet up and there was no context they were like can you meet up tonight or tomorrow night or something and it was super urgent um <laughs> and at the time we were super busy we were like oh we can meet you know like a few days from now not tomorrow night or whatever and they were like oh 
it, if we can meet sooner rather than later, that would be great. And so at this point we were confused and <laughs> we thought maybe they wanted us to babysit their kids. We weren't really <laughs> sure. <Yeah. laughs> we were trying to go over what could possibly be so time sensitive. Um, but we ended up making some time and we met with them and they um, basically said that they uh, were planning on moving their fam family to Collingwood for some different opportunities uh, that were there for their family. And they had this amazing space in the ward of Guelph and they wanted it to go to um, someone who was really focused on community and collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, and so they asked if we would be interested in taking over the Leafs. Um, and we, I think we initially were kind of like, yes, but let's think about this for a bit. Um, <laughs> and so for a bit, <laughs> for a bit. Yeah. We, <laughs> Abby drove me home that night, which I think was a five minute drive from where we were before. Um, and at that time we like literally the end of the drive, we were like, we can't, we can't say no to this. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Abby, do you want to Continue. Yeah, I think, I think, um, and it's funny because both Omri and I didn't necessarily have our kind of Guelph roots set at that time too. Like we were just, we didn't even graduate university. We were kind of like, okay, what's our next step? Like we hadn't had a full plan on figuring out what we're, where we were going to be um, individually. And so this opportunity came up and I think Omri and I were both like, like this is one of those like say yes moments, right? Like you have to trust your gut on when to say no and when to say like hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that so, really so, yeah, figure yeah, it out later. We, we, took, yeah. we took on we took on the lease and and started otherwise studios. And I think like um like to us community collaboration, like uh staying connected, like all of those things are like the the core of why we started the studio and I think um like even today like those are still the main things that we're always coming back to and focusing on no matter like what kind of programming we're doing what kind of collaboration we're doing like those that's like our number one for sure well definitely that's that's amazing that's that sounds probably like the most wealth thing ever so <laughs> I don't think you need to worry about, about that at all because it's a very yeah definitely very just jump and go and do it and, and that's, yeah. that's, that's amazing yeah. um yeah. Uh, so I'm realizing our, our time's getting a little short it's been a, a great great chat and I think we should maybe have like a part two or something like that sometimes that we can keep on talking Aww, about yeah, that'd be so nice. <laughs> um but uh yeah so thanks so much for doing this um yeah I'd like to you know keep on talking at some point so That'd be great if we can do another another episode of follow up and get to know for more sure. about the studio and, and what you guys are what you're up to and, and all that. So but um yeah, thanks so much for for doing this and uh really excited for all that the studio is doing and, and everything that you're uh creating and and collaborating with and, and all that sort of stuff. Thank Sweet. you. Thanks, thanks so much Nick, for, for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we really <laughs> appreciate you reaching out to us and yeah. and picking our brain a little bit. It's um nice to to feel connected with the community. Yeah, most definitely. That was a great conversation. I definitely lost track of time there. So yeah. <laughs> hopefully I didn't take up too much of your time. But um, so th thanks again for doing this. Um, thanks for everyone who's tuned in to this uh, week's episode. Uh, be sure to check out Otherwise Studios on all of their social accounts. Um, connect with them if you're interested in uh, collaborating. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>